Rory is still with us. We're going to talk rugby. Um, the Munster situation is evolving. They're due to land in Schiphol in an hour. They're going to somehow make it from there back to their, their homes and they'll sit in their rooms for 10 days trying not to waste too much and then a portion of them will end up playing in the Champions Cup. But what happens the league? Well, I think it's been the kind of bubbling under story because the Munster, getting Munster home has been the, the front and centre of the, of, of, of the story this week for understandable reasons. And, and now that they are largely home, there's still 14 of them still there and Cardiff will also get back. I think on Thursday they're leaving, so they're still in South Africa, but they're coming back on Thursday. The question then becomes, what's the future of the URC? What's the immediate future of the URC? Apparently the South Africans are raging because they came over to Europe for five, six weeks and played games and did their bubbles and went and supported each other in Wales and, and kind of lived this life. And at the first sign of trouble, in their view, the European teams tucked and ran. Um, and they feel like that more effort should have been made to get those games across the line, even behind closed doors at the weekend. Now, with the number of cases, you struggle to see how that could have happened. But they're, I mean, they're, Pretty feeling pretty marginalised anyway after the summer and the yeah. Lions and, and the Razzie stuff and they feel that they're not feeling much love so they're pretty important stakeholders and all this so if they're annoyed that's a problem you've also got this prospect of the all of the other provinces plus Munster now are fixed the plan I think is to play these URC games that have been abandoned in the the, the spring window during the Six Nations Okay. so Munster are going to be asked to get another squad of 48 or so play, players and management and go back to South Africa, including probably some of the people who were still there, for two weeks to play two games, which in normal times would be lovely. Obviously. Without their internationals. But even just for a prospect of a player who's, who's stuck in a hotel now, are you going to tell your wife and kids that, look, I'm going back there? And it's not like a trip to Italy where you go to a Zebra the day before the match. You play in Parma and you fly home that night. This is a two-week stint and we see with COVID, things change so quickly. Omicron just appeared and suddenly the borders were shut. So like that's a hard, hard sell for players. I'm sure Leinster, Ulster, and Connacht are looking at this. The South Africans are supposed to be here over Christmas. Like the, the I think Leinster, Leinster play the Lions or the Stormers uh, just before the Heineken Cup uh, round three in January. There is so much at, at play here. Like, will they be allowed to travel? You know, they have to get dispensations to come come across. And it's just, a, I mean, the logistical challenge of playing a tournament across five public health jurisdictions, including one which is a ten-hour flight away, is difficult as is, you know in in normal times. But during a pandemic, it was always going to be ambitious to pull it off, and we're seeing that now. And I, I struggle to see how they, unless they they rejig the format and do a conference system or something, you know, where they, where each team plays each in each other's regions, and then you have a playoffs yeah, at the end yeah. of the year when things are a bit better and the weather's nicer and hopefully numbers are down. I struggle to see how they pull it off as it's currently constituted, but we're six rounds in. So how do you, like, do you abandon? Do you just strike off those six rounds? I don't envy them. And it does, it's not a huge organisation, the URC. It's not like the Premier League or, or even the English Premiership, which has, you know, years and years of of experience. It's it's quite a stripped back organisation, the URC, and it needs to be bulked up over the next couple of years in terms of the infrastructure behind it. So there's a small number of people making these decisions. There's unions, there's all sorts of p- people at play there's doctors, I'm sure, involved as well. It's tricky. I don't yeah. know. And, then, like, and the South Africans are supposed to come into the European Cup next year. So this is supposed to be their vehicle to qualify for next year's European Cup. So that's another issue as well. So it's 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 messy. It is messy. And it, it's difficult. And you wish them all the best, but it's not a problem that um, there's a, an obvious solution to. But there won't be games. You'd be very surprised if there were games with South African teams in them. This side of the Six Nations, really, given everything that's going on. Like, we're, you know, we keep hearing about more... Uh, strenuous. The, the kids are being asked to wear masks in school, and we're like, "No, no, come on! You can bring a couple of teams over. That's fine." And I'm sure that they, I'm sure that they could bubble and they could have charter flights. And it was only them on the flights, and everybody would be tested, PCR tested, on the flights, before the flights, the day after, to make sure that nothing happened. And I'm sure it's doable. But who else gets the derogations then? Well, they, well, I take that point. I I think sport has been given, you know, elite sport has been lucky in that it's been given exemptions heretofore, and I don't see why that wouldn't continue. But if you're a South African player. And you live in, I mean, look, it's your livelihood, so eventually you'll do what you're told. But even a South African administrator is going, well, I, why Why are we going over there for five weeks when they wouldn't stay for, for two? And we don't see it that way because they're Munster players and we know them and we can we can empathise with what they've gone through, I think. And, you know, the idea of being stuck over there is pretty grim. But those South African players are, are 
are, are, are sacrificing an awful lot to, to keep the show on the road. Yeah. And they're going to be reluctant to travel as well because they may get stuck in Europe and not be able to get home from their families. And in fairness, maybe it would be different during the window for the Six Nations in that you would have a separate squad of players who are not available to you anyway um, because they will be playing for the Ireland team in the Six Nations. Like, do you now need two squads where you can send one to South Africa that'll be good enough to compete against the best teams in South Africa away from home with the Springboks which and, will, and, will be available at that point and you'll also need uh, so, to, to fix the current situation right to, if, to just to, to tease out what the South African um, unrest and unease is about could Munster have stayed there yeah they could have stayed there but then they wouldn't have been able to fulfil their European Cup fixture that's the problem isn't it Yeah. if in advance they'd been told you're going to have to quarantine for two weeks. You'd send a team, they would go for two weeks, you'd keep your strongest team. Like, it's not it's not ideal, but to keep the show on the road, that's what you had to sacrifice in advance. Maybe they would have done that, maybe they wouldn't have done that, I don't know. It's a big squad, and, and there's less fixtures this year. We've seen, we've had five weeks off, and they played one round of A games, and players have been playing AAL, and like, there's guys currently within the... Leinster have the biggest squad, and would traditionally have used... 50, 55, 60 players across mm. the season not traditionally but in the last couple of years because yeah. there's so many games in different windows that's gone now so you're, you're keeping players really for, for two games in a season it's not really realistic and sustainable so there's I think they will come up with a, a secondary competition a kind of a B&I Cup or a, a, you know, a, a URC Cup where they will get those players games to keep them interested across, across the season but to be able to to do that, I don't see that as being realistic. I don't think it's it's a good idea, really. And I mean, it's short term. You would hope that this will clear and we will go back to just being able to come and go as we please from from other countries. But there's no guarantee that it's going to ever be able to happen again. Um, but if you're committing to a cross a cross hemisphere competition involving ten hour flights, there are going to be logistical issues. Um, trying to did it, you know tallied that with playing in Europe at the same you know a week later it was a difficult enough challenge for Munster to fly back from South Africa and go straight into the first round of the Heineken Cup like they lost the European Cup semi-final a couple of years ago on the back of two weeks in South Africa when they turned up against Racing uh, 92 and didn't perform um, having played you know like and you've got to think that travel played a part in that and that's you know Super Rugby teams have been doing this for years but it's, it's a new challenge for, for, for us and look it's a, it's a weird league it doesn't really make any sense you would never have set out and designed a league involving Welsh, Scottish, Irish Italian and South African But they teams. did in a way. But it's whoever's left. Yeah. It's all like no one wants us. Like ideally we'd be in a British and Irish league and we'd be playing against Leicester and Bath and So Keith Wood's been talking about a Lions League for years. Of no interest. But like is, is there no money that would convince them? Is there not like a They have their thing. The French love like that the Premiership has a tradition and it has a history and, and sometimes I find it weird that they're so obsessed by it and the French are the same, but they have and in fairness, it has become things. a much better league. Like yeah. it was really boring for about eight or nine crowds. years, and over the last couple of years, the rugby has vastly improved, and the style of play has vastly improved. Kind of like uh, Gaelic football, shit for a decade. All of a sudden, the attacking comes to the fore, and uh, and just like we love our derbies, like they they quite enjoy Leicester playing Bath and Leicester playing Northampton, and they don't see any reason why they want to play the Scarlets. And like you might like have, well, I mean, Leicester will probably come in and, and quite win the thing started. so I mean you're, you're kind of voting for Christmas there as well but but you also would have games against Dragons and games against they don't see Connacht as a you know I'm insulting an entire province here but they wouldn't see Connacht as a draw and they would see it as a bit of a pain in the ass to have to go to Galway every every couple of months Yeah. Um, and that's that's a sell like, you know, do they want Zebra and Treviso in their league? No, no you so believe... you kind of can't cherry pick Leinster, Munster, and Ulster, <laughs> and maybe the Scarlets. Like that's what they'd like to do, maybe, maybe. But they're quite happy playing each other. They, you know, they they don't want. To, that's why we have this strange, unloved competition. That I think is better with the South Africans in it from a quality point of view and Definitely. an interest point of view. Yeah, but logistically, it becomes yeah. yeah well, the four the four that are there can be great, and it could be a very good condition uh, tr- competition. But it's such a logistical nightmare. It has become a complete nightmare. Um, let's talk about the, the Connacht performance last weekend in weather that was fairly similar to what was in, in Tala last yeah. night. Even worse, actually. And on the back of the performance the previous time out against Ulster, uh, there's something really brewing in Connacht. And every time you listen to Andy Friend, he's, he's taken all the blame, he's taken all the responsibility for anything that bad that happens and he's given all the credit for all the good stuff that happens to his coaching ticket and his his players and I always have any dealings with him. You come away feeling well. I definitely would like to play for him. He's like and says all the says all the right stuff. But then his teams are starting to back it up on a consistently basis. It's like that's an incredible job he's doing at the moment. 
Absolutely. Um, he's, a, he's he's very impressive. He's very likable. And he's the kind of coach and they're the kind of setup. A little bit like, like, like when Leicester won the Premier League in 2016. They make everyone else look bad because they're doing it with much worse resources in a worse stadium and worse... Con- like, they played rugby on Friday night in the worst conditions I've experienced. I was down there and I would I would argue with Nathan that, that maybe that the... Uh, the, the, the Connacht's conditions on Friday night were were even were the worst I've I've seen in a long time, and they scored seven tries. One of one of which was a penalty try, but that was also they were all through their backs, and it was all through incisive attacking play. Even the penalty try was a player you know cutting around and I mean being forced in touch with an illegal tackle. It was incredible, and like again, like the Irish football team last night, you do have to take the fact that the Ospreys were not very good, but it was pretty much the same Ospreys team who beat Munster. Didn't fancy it in the wet, wet, a wet night in Galway, but still they had to be beaten. And they had Connacht had a debutant centre uh, who was nineteen or twenty, uh, Shane Bolton. They've signed from South Africa, not mapped, wasn't in any of the Super Rugby franchises. They they identified him, Irish qualified, signed him, and they had Orm McNulty playing a fullback who's making his first start, a former under twenty, former former Ireland under twenty player who's from England. Uh, initially, but is Irish qualified, and he scored a try, and it was his first start, and he was, and he had the courage of his own convictions because he'd been backed by these coaches to go and play in the worst conditions possible. I was so impressed by it, and and yeah, Andy Friend gives a lot of credit, particularly to Pete Wilkins, who's his senior coach. So that's the same role as Larkham and, and Stuart Lancaster, albeit with a much lower profile. And he's a very impressive pl- person. I, he did his he did press yesterday, really good talker, really good clarity around what he wants the players to do and very much they're being empowered he no he was their defence coach and okay. he's been promoted and now he has responsibility because there was a shake up with the backroom team in the, in the yeah the two kind of homegrown guys left Jimmy Duffy and Nigel Carroll who's now at Glasgow and he he stepped up and he friend has kind of gone more power, kind of umbrella view of, of, of the whole organisation and, and Wilkins has taken over as the on field right. I mean friend still has a huge influence Wilkins, it really interesting English guy went to Australia, worked in Australian Super Rugby franchises as an analyst and as a coach, and got spotted by friend, brought home, but brought brought to Ireland by friend. Not a huge profile, but very intelligent. One of these, a bit like what you kind of hear about Ragnik and all these people, like kind of a, a self made coach who didn't have the playing career, and he's doing a really really good job, and the players really like it, and they really buy into it, and they have a clear identity of how they want to play. They they are trying to move away from the inconsistency because they, the, what they used to do was have these big one-off games apart from 2016 and then they wouldn't back it up and they, that's why they were so happy with Friday night because an Ospreys at home was the kind of game that they would have let slip and they have lost to the Dragons there already but they are, they're very impressive I think they'll, they'll give Leinster a good rattle on Friday night It's going to be a very interesting game because Leinster have to pick a strong team like they have to get their team that they want to play or the majority of the team that they want to play and start right. the game Ireland team, yeah, basically, yeah. minus one or two monster players. Yeah, no, they do, and they because and they're, they're, they're playing and who's injured at the moment. They're playing Bath next week. Yeah, Ryan Sexton, Gibson Park, and um, so it's not the full the full back. But you're bringing in Ross Byrne, you're bringing in Ryan Baird, you're bringing in uh, you're bringing in Ross Byrne, not Harry Byrne. No, definitely Ross Byrne at the right. moment. Yeah, well, I, I, for for Europe, I, I don't think there's a I don't think there's a debate in that, on that in Leinster at the moment. Like Harry Byrne came off the bench against Ulster, didn't play well. He's played twice for Leinster this season. He got twenty minutes against the against Zebra as a starter and got injured that day but before he came off he had a really poor game made a lot of mistakes and then he came off come off, off the bench to replace his brother against Ulster on Saturday and made an awful lot of mistakes as well his best performance was that half an hour against Argentina but that was a fairly beaten Argentina team by then they were down to 14 men for a while and he got to enjoy himself in front of a big crowd he's an awful lot of proving to do Like I, I really rate him I really think he's a very good player but at some stage he's going to come, have to come off the bench for Ross and kill Ross like he's got to go that's not my brother that's my rival and come off the bench and just and Ross's chances run a game run a game well beat Ulster you know and he yeah. didn't do that like that was a good Leinster team last Saturday night and they, they didn't play like a good Leinster team not that Ross played particularly well either but I just think Ross is still ahead, very much ahead of him in that in that team um, I, I, we don't know the teams yet as we're talking right now on uh, Wednesday morning um, what what you expect the full Leinster team for yeah, this well, they're, they're kicking off the European campaign next week so I would fully expect as strong as they can go with the injuries that they have because they need a dry run before that game um, they'll they'll rest lads they, they, they'll, the, the players all got a, a little bit of a holiday after November it's still very early in the season so I, I wouldn't expect any player management issues at this point so okay. it's a really good test for that Connacht team Leinster have lost four times in the RDS in 2021 Leinster are 17 point favourites for that game it doesn't 15 seem make, against Ulster that doesn't seem to make that much sense no but they do have the capacity Like they absolutely blew Connacht away in the sports ground when they get it right 
like they beat the All Blacks effectively. You know, I mean, they're I mean, team. right? They <laughs> are very good. They have a lot yeah. of very very yeah. good players. It's just so that that, that kind of that, I don't know. It feels like Connacht are building to a performance, and this would be good, really good test. Tight five wise, Leinster could blow anyone away in this league, and if they if Porter Kelleher and Furlong are on the pitch, that's very hard to play against, and that could be the difference between the teams. But I wouldn't. I, I wouldn't discourage anyone from, from that taking on that spread. I think that's quite generous. All right. Rory, good stuff. Thanks a million for joining us today. Oh, sure.